Okay. Okay. So now we can get started. My name is Rebecca Kiesling, and I am the Director of Programs at the Benjamin Rush Institute. I want to thank everyone for joining us this afternoon. I am very excited to have our next installment of BRI's virtual live event series. Um, if you're not familiar with the Benjamin Rush Institute, we have been around for over nine years now. We were started, uh, our primary mission is to educate medical students from around the country on free market healthcare alternatives. Um, medical students are not given the opportunity to learn about anything except big business, big healthcare, big government healthcare um, as they go through medical school. And that's primarily because medical schools are funded by th those big hospitals um, and the big government that we are all used to. So that's what they're being taught in, in medical school. Um, with the help of experts in, um, you, they can be practitioners, they can be policy experts, we bring that free market health care to them. I say that my primary reason for doing that is because the burnout rate of doctors is getting higher and higher. Um, we want to make sure that they know that there are alternatives to big government and big bureaucracy and overregulation. And it's more important now than ever before to make sure that they have those alternatives before them because if they have that information and they believe that big government and overregulation is not the way to go, they can advocate for those changes. And as we know now, we need to make those changes. Um, we are so fortunate to have one of the biggest advocates, one of the biggest changers in, um, in healthcare uh, as our guest today. Um, I have been a fan of hers, uh, a personal fan of hers um, for as many years as I can count. And I am I had a great conversation with her yesterday that just got me thinking about so many things, um, as most of her work has. Um, Dr. Marilyn Singleton is a board certified anesthesiologist and the immediate pres past president of the AAPS, uh, which the Association of American uh, Physicians and Surgeons, and if you are not familiar with them, please become so. Um, after being told that they don't take Negroes at Stanford, she graduated from Stanford and earned her MD at UCSF Medical School. Dr. Singleton completed two years of surgery residency at uh, UC San Francisco Medical Center and her anesthesiology uh, residency at Harvard's Beth, Beth Israel Hospital. As she was on faculty at Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore, uh, she returned to California for private practice at Cedar sinai um, While she was still working at oper in the operating room, because that wasn't quite enough, she attended UC Berkeley Law School, focusing on constitutional and administrative law. Uh, Dr. Singleton interned at National Health Law Project, practice insurance and health law. She has published so many articles, given presentations on health policy, done radio and television appearances. She was a uh, congressional candidate in 2012. She started a blood pressure screening clinic. She has done everything. She has been everywhere. She has spoken on everything. And I am so excited to have her here today. I hope everyone will ask questions and be uh, as interactive as possible. We have questions um, both in our chat and um, in our Q&A here on, on Zoom, also on our Facebook page, which we are, um, which we are streaming to live here. Um, please ask questions and I will try to field them all. Um, I am so excited to have Dr. Singleton here with us today. I'm gonna turn it as soon as I figure out how, over to Dr. Singleton. Okay. It's all you. Okay. 
Are we all set? All righty. Hello, everybody, and thank you for coming. Um, as you see that every news outlet and everybody is talking about COVID, COVID, COVID. And I'm sure everybody's tired of it. Everybody's tired of, of the, the problems that COVID has started. I mean, starting with death and illness and, and disrupting our lives with lockdowns and learning and testing for students and our income as physicians in practice. But to me, one of the most unfortunate parts beyond losing people's lives is the injection of politics into a medical issue. And uh, we've got to have facts in order to properly deal with it. And as physicians, we try to deal with facts. We try to quiz the patient and find everything out about them and then go on to make our treatment plan. And somehow this COVID has been all mixed up and it, it's starting to limit our ability to practice with our own judgment. And what I want you to do, I don't want this to be some great big old huge lecture. I want everybody to use the chat very generously and make sure you ask a lot of questions and then uh, Rebecca figure out how to pile all those in because it's kind of hard to talk and read the chat at the same time, but I will keep it up. And at the end of the chat, um, I'm gonna put some links and my email so you can ask any more questions. Just a little bit of background on the COVID. One, we've had pandemics before and we've had unneeded panic before that somehow has, has actually had some bad consequences. And a lot of this may be before your time. Back in 1976, when there was the first swine flu, we had a second one in 2009. They had a, got to have a vaccine, got to have a vaccine. They came up with a vaccine and it was an absolute disaster. There were about 4,000 people who were injured, many of whom had Guillain-Barre uh, syndrome or other neurological syndromes, and uh, about 400 people died. So this gives people kind of some food for thought as far as let's step back just a little bit here and see what we're really dealing with. And most people said, uh, just like with the bird flu, oh, it's very contagious, so we really have to worry about it. And then they had first thought that about Ebola and it wasn't contagious. The first real example we had with COVID was the Diamond Princess cruise ship. And that was the perfect Petri dish. We had all these people together, 3,400 people on the boat and 700, some 700 got infected, and about half of those were asymptomatic. So that gave an early idea of what might be going on. There's a fire engine going by, I hope you can't hear it. Um, so what is the coronavirus? There's a lot of them. This isn't like, oh, this is the first time we've ever seen it. There's about seven around, four of them roam around in humans all the time, and about 30% of common colds are caused by coronavirus. The interesting thing about this one, and its real name is SARS-CoV-2, because it's very similar to the first SARS virus from back in 2003. Interestingly, everybody thought that was gonna kill the world, and indeed, they were working on treatments and vaccine, but amazingly, that just burned out. So that ended up being around for about a year, had about a 10% fatality rate, but only about 8,000 people got it. The same with MERS, except MERS had a, it, which is also a coronavirus, had about a 34% uh, fatality rate, but only a few thousand people got it. So. These things have been roaming around, scientists know about it, and in fact, we're very lucky because of these other ones, it's not completely unknown what the background and basis is. And one of the things that was at first disturbing is they knew that it attached to ACE2 inhibitors or ACE2 receptors. And so those are in the heart, lung, intestine, kidney, 
and we have patients who are on these ACE2 inhibitor drugs, and would that be a problem? Well, as it's turned out, it's not, and so that's a whole nother research line that folks are going down. And so there's a lot we know, and that's a positive thing that's going on with regard to the virus. So the other thing that's important to note, just and, and it's the sort of thing, it's difficult to discuss sometimes with the public because it can sound somewhat crass to say that 90% of the deaths are in people over 60. And it, it, it's the, the sort of thing where, well, don't we care about people over 60? Well, of course we do. But you have to look at these facts when you're trying to figure out what to do with your own patients. And that 98% of the cases are mild. And this is something that if you're trying to create news stories or panic modes or whatever, that you don't want to point out that people are recovering. And if you don't have a pre-existing problem, you likely will not go to the hospital. 90% of people who go to the hospital are, have a pre-existing problem. And interestingly, obesity, and, and this will come in later when I talk about the importance of what we do as physicians. Now, just a, a little bit as, as far as the lingo that you'll see used in uh, some of the CDC paperwork is quarantine versus isolation. Quarantine is what they do to people who've been exposed. Isolate is what you do to folks who actually have the disease. And um, there's criteria as to why you should do this when you don't know how contagious a disease is, um, when you don't have efficient testing to know who has the disease. And if there's no effective medicines or a vaccine, then you resort to quarantine. Why I bring this up, it's very important because there's a lot of buzz out there about people going into your home and taking you, taking your children or whatever. And some people say, oh, that is just conspiracy theory. Well, let me tell you the legal basis for this. There's the National Disaster Medical System. And in that memorandum that the government can declare a, in a medical emergency for a quote, significant outbreak of an infectious disease. And this can just be declared by the Secretary of Health and Human Services. So it doesn't necessarily mean there's any legislature involved, how many physicians are involved, who knows, that that's a decision that can be made and we don't know all the input that goes into that. And so the CDC has, and HHS has this authority by statute now, what they're supposed to do for preventing the spread of a communicable disease is use the, quote, least restrictive means. Now, the least restrictive means is quarantine or isolation in your home. But this is very important. If they identify someone as a threat, someone who doesn't want to stay at home, or doesn't want a vaccine, the government can take that person into custody. And while they're in custody, the CDC will, quote, arrange for adequate food and water, appropriate accommodation, appropriate medical treatment, and means of necessary communication. Now, only two years ago, did they add due process to this, where within 72 hours, you can get a medical review, you can have your case sent to the courts. And um, it's, it sounds very draconian. Now, on one hand, you say, well, it's a communicable disease that could kill people. Uh, of course, you should isolate these people. But if we look at the case of COVID, where we just discussed that 90% of the people who are having a problem are people who are institutionalized in nursing homes or the elderly, then why do you have to do all this to the rest of the population rather than just focusing on those who appear to be very sick or dying from the disease? So this, this brings us into kind of the ethics of just as a physician, 
we have a duty of care to take care of patients and we shouldn't be scared because somebody has a disease. Now, in my day, AIDS was the disease. And in fact, with COVID, we're much luckier than with AIDS. We had no idea what AIDS was, what caused AIDS for two years after AIDS was out. And working in the operating room, we didn't, and I was in a neighborhood that had a large gay population. So we had a lot of AIDS patients. And we didn't know whether we should let pregnant people uh, take care of them. There are a couple of pregnant nurses in the recovery room and we didn't let them take care of those patients. And then ultimately universal precautions came in. And then once we discovered AIDS was not easily transmitted from one person to another, there were certain behaviors that you had to do, but just walking by somebody uh, in contrast to flu, common cold in this COVID-19. So we went right ahead and took care of people. I'll tell you one thing, you have to be smart as a physician. I'll tell you the first thing you should go out and do is get an Ambu bag. I carried, when AIDS came out, I carried an Ambu bag in my car. I really never wanted that moral dilemma of what happened if I saw someone dead on the street? Would I want to give them mouth to mouth? And so that way I kind of solved that problem. I kept an oral airway pair of gloves and an Ambu bag in my car and actually had to use it once. Um, now the hospital, on the other hand, we as physicians have that duty to take care of patients. The hospital has a duty to take care of us. It has a duty to safeguard the vulnerable patients and a duty to safeguard it, its employees or folks that work there. Now. Of course, uh, there's nothing that's 100%, but they absolutely have to provide the protective equipment, a plan for what to do in the hospital, how they're gonna arrange the beds, what they're gonna do with the various floors and the wards and all that sort of thing. That's the hospital's job, and that should not be the job of the person on the front line. Their duty is to take care of patients, and the administrators, have to um, uh, do their job, which is to administer and to do it properly. Now, one of the duties that the administrators have is the so-called duty to guide. And this, sometimes I think we wonder about. That means they come up with guidelines for what to do. And I know this is the age of algorithms and all that. But what has that done to clinical judgment? And even though they say in guidelines, you have to respect a patient's individuality, it's still, do you want doctors always just right in lockstep with the guideline? Now, the pro of that is that if you're very panicked and rush rush and a bunch of people come in, you have a guideline, you don't have to make a decision that you'll be vilified for later because it was an on-the-spot decision that it was a hospital guideline. But on the other hand, if you make a decision because especially for us older guys who've been around a long time, sometimes your gut feeling is the right answer just because you've developed clinical judgment over the years and there's just some things you know. I remember once the patient came to the operating room, he was a bring back from an aortic aneurysm and I was with a resident and um, the surgeon says, you gotta put him to sleep right away. I said, something else is wrong here. Um, his blood pressure is okay, but something else is wrong. It turned out his potassium was eight. Something about him did not look right. I quickly got an EKG and started doing insulin glucose, all these things to lower the potassium. Went ahead, did the case stop the bleeding and all was well. But sometimes just having practiced medicine for a while, you actually might know because your hands are on that particular patient, something that's not in the guidelines. So that can be sometimes the uh, downside of guidelines. Now the CDC, and this is what's bothersome about this politics injection, they have a job. It's supposed to be contact tracing, isolate who has the disease, and vaccinate if there's a vaccine. They're not really supposed to be practicing medicine. And for us, 
autonomy of the patient is central to the good practice of medicine. And, and AMA, anyone, we know that from the Hippocratic Oath, um, all agree to that. So you can't have the government making on the spot clinical decisions. And this seems to be happening. And um, we have to have guidelines about rationing because we don't want that to be, well, I'm gonna save my friends, I'm gonna save a Supreme Court justice, but I'm not gonna save the poor schnook who lives in an apartment in downtown LA. That should not be part of how you ration something. It should be based on clinical presentation only. Sadly, we know and we've seen it, that's not the case. And I used to tell my patients who were having trouble in their HMO, and this was after Jimmy Carter had had his melanoma, I said, you tell your doctor, you tell that doctor right now, you want the same treatment Jimmy Carter got. And people kind of back off on when they were trying to be a little stingy with treatments. So, and that's something that you all remember to tell your patients, you know, they, they have to demand because sometimes treatments are given to the famous, the rich and famous, and that's just the way it is. So we have to um, acknowledge that that's the case, but you tell patients to fight for their rights. One of the things we're seeing with regard to medical freedom, and this is all in the news now because President Trump said he was taking hydroxychloroquine. Well, way back in 2003, again, with the first SARS, in fact, our own CDC had found that in vitro, chloroquine inhibited SARS. So that's how this virologist in France thought, hmm, maybe we should use this for this SARS-2 virus. And he appeared to have good results and other people started trying it. A doctor in New York gave it to a thousand patients. So it's not like it was totally off the wall and a drug that had been around for 55 years. Suddenly politics came in it and 47 out of the 50 states had some sort of pharmacy board rule that the person had to have arthritis or lupus and they would limit the pills to 15 and got all involved in the practice of medicine. And this is something, this is why in the beginning I said, this is to me the most dangerous part because that will be long lasting. COVID will be taken care of one way or the, the other, whether it burns out as many of these things do, or whether there's a vaccine, but the political ramifications and the ramifications for we physicians in allowing someone to tell us how to practice medicine, that could change our practice for years. And we, we just can't have that happen. Um, and we know in giving meds, and if we wanna try something on our patient, Again, this is where patient autonomy comes in. The patient can say, no, just send me home. I, I don't care. And you say, okay, fine, that's your business to do that. Or the patient says, yeah, I'm willing to try and I'll take the consequences, particularly if their risk is worse than the risk of whatever it is you wanna try on them. And this is certainly the principle behind the right to try, but the right to try has its parameters that um, uh, the person has to be near death and you know a, a whole lot of other little things. And with COVID, perhaps a person isn't near death, perhaps a person's asymptomatic, but they've read the studies and they say, hey, I wanna give this a try. I don't have any heart problems. And the doctor should be able to do that. You have to be able to use your clinical judgment. And uh, what's really sad to me about the politics behind this is now that they're doing the famous double blind studies with random individuals, because there's been so much fear mongering on the television and, and in, uh, by pundits, who aren't doctors, that now patients don't wanna join the study. 
they've made them afraid. This QT interval problem, one, not that many people as, as a general population have QT interval problems de novo. And then when you add the problem that hydrochloroquine uh, can cause, that not everybody is gonna get that. So it's made out and they don't even say that, of course, because what does the general public know about QT? They just say, oh, if you have a pro heart problem, well, lots of people have heart problems, but it's quite a specific heart problem. So this in injection is, it, it, it actually is kind of sickening and, and I don't wanna see it happening with other things. I know people, and uh, the pro-life group were worried that they would force people to give abortions or, or give abortion pills and all this. And there's a very large group behind that. So that kind of was backed off. And then we had the Hobby Lobby Supreme Court decision. But the idea that somebody would even think to force a doctor to do something is, is really rather disturbing, especially because there's a million doctors in the United States. And unless you're way out in the country in, in Appalachia or way up in Alaska, you can find another doctor who's willing to take the course of action that someone else is recommending. That's the great, wonderful thing about having all sorts of different opinions, all sorts of different kinds of people and a patient can find the doctor that comports with their opinion. Again, with the exception of out in the country, and, and that's a real problem in the medical system since there are so few doctors out there. So in this environment, what are you to do? Okay, you're bound by your ethics to treat your patient as an individual, but you have CDC guidelines to follow knowing your patient can legally be taken from their home and put under government quarantine. So this is something that if you have a patient who's very leery of wanting to get tested, and, and which I don't blame them. As soon as you get a test, then you are in a registry. So some people don't want to get tested. And it's your job as a doctor to let them know all these things and what course of action they should take when it comes to allocating scarce resources. As it turns out, we have resources. Other, really, New York is suffering. I'm in Los Angeles, and two of our huge hospitals are half empty. They've laid off 40% of the doctors and nurses they clearly have the resources and they just aren't being used. The naval ships were had six patients and the two hospital ships. So uh, this scarce resource allocation has turned out not to be true, which is good. And But we don't want public health taking the decision out of the hands of the doctors and patients. And that's just really important and it's something that we all have to fight for. Um, the other thing that's going to come up is this whole idea of immunity passports. Now, again, it doesn't matter to me where you stand, but you have to know these things are out there and patients are going to come to you and wonder, okay, if you advise me to get a serological test, my test is positive, and so they say, okay, fine. That means that you get a certificate that, and assuming that antibody protection lasts, you get a certificate that you can go back to work. Now, what if your test is negative and there isn't a vaccine? Does that mean you have to stay at home in perpetuity? Because you just might not get the disease. A lot of people just might not get to the disease. I mean, and the more we're learning about it and the mechanism of action and, and one mechanism that seems to fit with how the disease acts is that the immediate response to the virus is tamped down and the secondary response, which is the cytokine storm, is revved up. And so that's how you get massive viral replication. And this is, of course, why people are pro-hydrochloric 
hydroxychloroquine plus zinc, that the zinc stops the replication of the virus. And the hydrochloroquine helps the zinc get inside the cell. So, and, and it's interesting because you don't hear people talking about that. And even in some of the studies, so-called studies that have started, they aren't adding zinc, they aren't adding vitamin D, vitamin C, all these other things that the folks who are using it add. So you have a, 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 a multiple effect. And this comes into our position as doctors that, and, and the good part about being a doctor, you can advise patients about all these things. But anyway, back to the immunity passports. This is gonna be something that's going to come up and you might have a patient who has these symptoms or whatever. And the patient says, I don't wanna get a test. You know, I'm just gonna to tough it out. I'll stay at home. You know, you can get, which amazes me, a pulse oximeter for $10. I got my first one at Cedars. We had to buy our own when they came out. You know, great big, huge machine. And they were $3,200. And that was back in 1982 or three. So you can imagine how much money that was back then. And now you can get them $10. You know, get your patient a little pulse oximeter and tell them, hey, check, check your oxygen. And which is another weird thing about uh, this SARS-2 virus is it seems to be kind of stealth and can operate just on red cells and give you, as they're calling it, happy hypoxia, where the PO2 is 80, yet people aren't short of breath, they aren't tachypnic, nothing. So it's a, it's a very weird disease. And, and, and that's the other thing. You might wanna give that patient hyperbaric oxygen. Why would you throw them on a ventilator? And as they're discovering, which gives more credence to this direct red cell action theory is that they're not putting people on ventilators now. They realize that the ventilators are just pummeling the lungs and uh, using other means necessary, even like the old fashioned Gregory Hood to deliver more oxygen rather than uh, pummeling the lungs with positive pressure ventilation. Um, so uh, that's gonna come up. And then other questions that are going to come up with the patient. Okay, would you allow your patient to be part of a human challenge? Now, a patient might want to. They might be very scared of COVID. And to me, human challenges are kind of creepy and scary. Way back when, before um, uh, they had strong ethics, and in some countries they used to do that, Human challenges were just done on prisoners. So in other words, instead of having this step where you test it on monkeys, and then you take a, a virus and you just spew it in the air, you know, just like regular, give somebody a vaccine, the person just walks around society and see if they get sick. Okay that would be a normal test. A human challenge is actually where you give the vaccine and then you blow the, the virus right at them and see if they get sick. And, uh, you know, and, and this is something, and like I say, they, they used to just do this with prisoners who actually, you know, one can argue that nothing is voluntary in prison, but they did volunteer for more cigarettes or whatever. And, um, but, that's apparently being discussed because they want a vaccine so fast with COVID. So your patient might ask you that. Patient might say, well, that vaccine just came out last week and they're lining up at CVS to give them to you. Should I go down there and get it? What do you tell your patient? That you, know, you let them decide you want your patient to be one of the first thousand people that gets it? You know, That's between you and your patient. A lot of people are asking about masks and should they wear a mask? So many studies show and studies from before COVID, you know, was even thought about where um, the micron size is so small, it 
certainly gets through these silly cloth masks that everybody's wearing. And then the funny part about the mask is almost everybody I see with the mask, the mask is like this. And all the stuff's in the nose, so everybody has it all pulled down. So they aren't even wearing it properly. But other than an N95 mask, the particles can get through. So you should be able to tell your patient that. Now, obviously, if the grocery store says you have to have one on in order to shop, person has to slap something over on their face. But making a person wear a mask walking down the street out riding their bicycle seems a little silly. Have the data, be able to tell your patient, and be able to make a decision because they are going to ask. One of the other big ethical things that's coming up is some of these laws want to give complete malpractice liability during the season of COVID. So then the question is, what's, what's COVID? Are, is nobody going to be held for malpractice for anything? And this could be scary. I can see why you want doctors to be able to treat. Uh, you don't know exactly how to, how to treat the disease and something might not work right. But we also don't want people to think they have a license to kill. So it, I think it takes making sure your ethics are really right there in the forefront if some of this legislation is passed that gives one complete liability, uh, relief from liability if you're taking care of a COVID patient. And the other thing that might do, and we've already seen this happening, is the mislabeling of patients as COVID disease just because they're positive for the SARS-CoV-2 virus, because there's plenty of positive people that are completely asymptomatic and they could die of a broken leg. But if you decide you want um, to escape malpractice liability, then say, well, they had COVID. So, you know, these are things that are going to test us, certainly in, in the near future and in the distant future, as these things continue. The SARS-CoV-2 is not the last weird virus that's going to come down the pike, and you know it, that they're out there, and they're always out there, and fortunately, we generally don't get sick. Um, the other big thing is we're seeing COVID as an excuse to move to single-payer health care. Already there's a bill, boy, that you wonder, did these people have these bills written last year, all the backup bills, to enhance Medicare, to give everybody who's uninsured Medicare, because they need insurance for COVID, and lower the, take away the premiums for older folks, and lower the co-pays. Basically, it was Medicare for all. So COVID shouldn't be an excuse for that. Either you want Medicare for all, or you don't but don't use this as an excuse to pass some sweeping legislation that of course will be here for years. And so we have to keep our eye and continue to be active uh, when we see things like that come up. And if you happen to be in a state that responds, write your congressman about it and say, don't let a public health emergency be the excuse for legislation it has nothing to do with helping people through the pandemic. Very important, very important thing to do. Now, the silver lining in all this, um, for all the doctors, young doctors, whomever, is that it really gives you a whole new way to practice medicine. This COVID epidemic has, is an opportunity to be creative, to use your intellectual curiosity to learn more about vitamins and um, other things that kind of, not really fringe, but oh, the dietitian knows that, or oh, the nutritionist knows that. And um, it's not just the realm of naturopaths, regular allopathic physicians need to know about what some of the effects of vitamins and other lifestyle choices are. Uh, bringing back to 90% of the people um, who were in the hospital of COVID 
have a pre-existing condition and the number one pre-existing condition is obesity. So again, it's our opportunity to speak out. I wrote an article about obesity as America's uh, pre-existing condition. I was vilified on Twitter for fat shaming. And all I'm trying to do is point out we have to do something about it. And just like how we had um, uh, a, a big push to stop people from smoking, we have to have a big push to make people realize that obesity is serious. And it's not just something to be laughed at or to look at on my 600 pound life, that there's a long way between being regular sized and having a, a normal BMI or just a few extra pounds to being 600 pounds. And then there's all the somewhere in between. And, um, all the diabetes, the pre-diabetes, children that are already diabetic. So this is an opportunity to really move a medical practice along the lines of total health. And um, I know there's been talks on DPC, and this is something DPC, direct primary care, really tries to look toward total health. Um, geriatric practice suddenly it can take on really a new status, let's say. People used to kind of look down or poo-poo, oh, it just takes care of old people. Well, guess what? COVID has brought the plight of older people to light. I do lectures and stuff on elder abuse and, and work with the police department with that. And um, so, there's a real problem in the elder community and part of it is they've become kind of throwaway and this brings elders to light and i was happy to see that not happy that they were dying but it's an op again an opportunity to have perhaps that specialty where you do work with older folks and suddenly it won't be considered like gee couldn't you get another job it's like no I'm really protecting the most vulnerable in society, folks who have made our society and they can't just become throwaway people. Um, and so these are kind of the way you can look at this problem as an opportunity rather than something that's just ripping apart everyone's life. And, um, I'm gonna to try to cast my eyes over to the chat and see the question. I'm kind of looking at the top here. AMA getting involved in policy, like in medical schools. Um, interestingly, when you look at the AMA as getting involved in policy, Kind of the problem is the AMA only represents 20% of physicians. So the question is, who's really behind the policy? And I mean, this is a whole other conversation is who's really running the AMA. And the AMA has some interesting relationships. Um, their lobbyists give to interesting folks. And so it's hard to know, are they the best person? I don't know. And, and the fact that it represents 20% of physicians, so it's certainly not a majority opinion. The question is, who should policy come from? Who should medical policy come from? Should it come from some of the more middle of the line think tanks who then bring in physician opinions? And that may be the better way to do it. Uh, I kind of think it is because once the AMA says something, people who don't realize how few physicians it represents and what their political lobbying ties are will think, oh, well, then that's the word. I remember the day when C. Everett Koop was Surgeon General. He was the Surgeon General par excellence. He was very reasoned, he was his own man, 
and um, he's worth looking up and reading his book. He, he, everyone loved him. And he was, he truly was America's Surgeon General. He wasn't a political tool. And he was looked up to like Dr. Dad. And if he had told you to do something, you'd probably do it. Now we got so much mixed information from the CDC and Surgeon General, NIH, you know, mass work, don't wear masks, work goes back and forth. Uh, COVID's on surfaces. Oh, that's, uh, that was weeks where they said, oh, it's on the surface for seven days. Well, maybe viral fragments were, but it turns out it's not infectious for all that time. And you don't need to be Cloroxing your surfaces down. But who knows? Next week, they might tell you to Clorox your surfaces again. So, you know, when you have this sort of uh, fragmented information, then uh, you don't know who to trust. And so it's kind of a tough call these days. Uh, so I'm, uh, you know, I'm kind of leery about saying for the AMA to have the, um, the final word on something. And then um, zinc and hy hydroxychloroquine. Um, yes, the whole way it works is by getting zinc into the cell. And there is called a, a ionophore, getting the zinc in, and it's the zinc that stops the replication of the virus. And that's what ultimately causes the inflammatory response. Now, the vitamin D, if you have about a quarter of your body out for 15 minutes, you get the average daily dose. But unless you have kidney disease or parathyroid problem that it's suggested if you're using it, if you're trying to gonna take an immunologic prophylactic regimen that you take at least 5,000 units a day. And, um, and also, you know, I don't know who's in the sun every day. And it's okay to still use sunscreen that the rays that you can get vitamin D from still can get through the sunscreen. So remember that, that's, that's important because a lot of people won't put their sunscreen on. They'll sit there and get melanoma trying to get some vitamin D. So um, uh, what else? Uh, vitamin A and then quercetin, which is in the onions and garlic, but you can get quercetin pills is also an ionophore, and that helps push the zinc into the cell. Now, interestingly, and, and this is something, again, why the data matters, that what are the two things that old people don't get? They don't get the sun, so they don't get vitamin D, and they tend to be low on zinc. Zinc, isn't found in a whole lot of things that you eat, but it is found in meat. And what are, what are we doing now but eating less meat? And the older you get, and certainly in old folks' homes, you never find beef. And, um, and most older kind of sick people who are eating in sure and kind of that awful food they serve in nursing homes, it's usually not meat. So they probably don't have very much zinc. So it's kind of interesting to me. Vitamin D and zinc are probably lacking in the people who are getting sick. And, and that's something that needs to be explored as well. Um, you know, so I, I don't have the answer to that, but it's, it's an interesting thing to note why these folks are getting so sick. So um, uh, we keep hearing additional options. Yeah, well, it is confusing. And, and one of the reasons it's confusing, because of course, nobody knows 100% for sure. But the important thing is, as long as you don't do anything that would hurt you in doing it for yourself or a patient, then it's okay to try. That's why, you know, some people talk about 10,000 international units, that could be a bit high if people overdo it. 5,000 seems to be good. And, and because 
for vitamin D levels, they say for it to actually do something, it should be in the high therapeutic range, not just over the, uh, I think it's 25, it's lower limit and normal. Now, the other thing that's fascinating is vitamin C. Now, you should take a couple grams of vitamin C a day, do like maybe one gram in the morning, one gram in the evening. Uh, some people um, uh, divide it up during the day. And interestingly, China had, had tons, literally, of vitamin C shipped in and that's what they were using, IV vitamin C, and apparently had good results. I always hate to quote something from China because we never know what to believe from China, but um, the shipments were real, let's say, and I'm sure they didn't get it and let it sit there. And um, so that's something else other people are trying, but certainly for us to stay healthy during this time, that that's not gonna hurt you either. And, and it won't hurt your patients. Um, next, N95 masks are rare. What other type can protect you if you can't buy N95? It's something better than nothing. Okay, this something better than nothing. What that works for are droplets. Let me give you, so I don't lie, the exact size. The larger droplets, and that's greater than five microns, um, remain in the air for a short time and travel less than one meter. So just think about that as far as how you're standing. But if you're in an air-conditioned room, those larger droplets can travel. So, and they could travel a little farther. So you could say just having on like a regular surgical mask or um, a material, there's actually um, a list of materials. Um, I can add that, I'll see if I can get into the internet and not ruin this. Um, in the order in which they will block out the larger droplets. A dish towel is the number one. These scarves that people put on are way, way down, like in the 30% range or something. And this is, the dish towel is about a 60% range. So in that regard, something is better than nothing. Now, the less than three micron droplets, and those are the ones, if in fact, the SARS virus is aerosolized. Those are the ones that'll go right through the mask. And there's a, a big South Korean study that was just pre, you know, a whole lot of pre-published stuff is coming out now because they don't want to wait for peer review, which is good. People need to know the information. Um, says that the viruses are found on both sides of the mask, inside, outside when they're just those regular cotton masks. So when people have all these designer masks and, you know, I kind of don't like the designer mask because that it admits that you're kind of saying, oh, this is part of my life. You know, when I have to go to the store with a mask, I have a, my black mask that, um, you know, because it's not fun and I don't want to make it fun. But um, uh, so it will help you if you're there and somebody does a big hit you and, and um, uh, sneezes on you, coughs on you, and the big droplets will be there. Now, the important thing is that when you take off the mask, let's say you get sneezed on, it's like, ugh, let me get rid of this thing. It's got the cooties on it, that when you take it off, you don't touch the outside because unless you then wash your hands right away, you just put the cooties on your hands. And, and this is part of the problem with the general public. They don't take the mask off from the inside, they take it out from the outside, and then the cooties are on your hands, and then you're right back where you start. So yeah, mask use is interesting. So one of the reasons certainly that healthcare workers get sick 
they get a bigger dose, they're in more contact than someone who's just passing you by on the street. So in that regard, if you kind of look at a, a dose related illness, you might feel like you're gonna get a smaller dose. But the South Korean study had, uh, it was a high amount of the viruses on both sides of the mask. So the important thing is that don't believe that it's totally protecting you at all, unless it's an N95. Now, the important thing is don't get those KN95s. Those are knockoffs. And maybe the K is for knockoff. I don't know. But those aren't really N95s. So don't be fooled by that. Um, uh, the N95s will probably become more plentiful as time goes on. Um, but again, you know, you think we'll save it for the healthcare workers, but they are available. Um, if you do wear a cotton mask, if you get a fabric um, like polypropylene, like the, the stuff that the hiking gloves that keep you really warm, that's an unwoven fabric and unwoven fabric protects more. You won't have the little respirator thing on there and you'll get kind of hot underneath, but it is protective because it's the woven fabric that, and, and even surgical masks are kind of woven fabric. So that's what lets the germs through. Bottom line, you'd be protected against gross spittle, but you certainly want to take it off right away after the person sneezes on you because it's going to burrow right through the mask. And how many survivors suffered? I don't know the figure on that. We're starting to see that. And now that people are looking at um, the vascular uh, thrombosis that's occurring, in fact, one of my firemen buddies, one of the fire department folks, a young, healthy guy, had a stroke uh, with his COVID. And they, he is awake, so who knows how he'll recover, but obviously having a stroke is a serious side effect. And I've read, and I, I haven't seen any compilations, just random articles here and there about people having kind of random things that are persisting longer. Now, it hasn't been long enough to know how long it's going to persist, but it's not as though, okay, you have the cold, it's over. And, and I don't know the percentage, and I don't know if there is a percentage out there yet. Maybe in three, four weeks, it'll be enough time to have gathered enough data to be able to give a reasonable percentage. And I think that's it there. Um, let me cut and paste. Okay. I cut and pasted my email. I have tons more links and whatnot. Now, on this chat, you can see those little dots over in the corner. Click on the dot. You've probably done enough Zooms to know this. You can save the chat. It comes out in text, but you can just save all those links there, or you can email me and I'll give you the links. And um, I'm going to try right at this moment. Let me click on something to get another internet screen open. And I will get a wonderful link.
This one is the data comes from the famous Johns Hopkins that was one of the first people to put a link up that put all the COVID data together and then other websites have taken the link and done more with it. This information is beautiful one. I like it because it's got beautiful graphs and um, easy to read, easy to see the data. They have all the major countries and you can see the trajectory and most are going down. And the interesting one, of course, is Sweden, who um, had voluntary social distancing, voluntary quarantine slash isolation, and um, they aren't doing any worse than anybody else. And their percentage of positive tests is 7.5. And in Los Angeles, it's about 5%, which is interesting, um, which is 40 times what would have been predicted by the number of people who were symptomatic and sought medical care. And certainly when you get a positive test, they try to ask you, were you sick in any way? And there were plenty of people who were sick in absolutely no way, just like the people on the Diamond Princess. I mean, I find the numbers from the Diamond Princess ship just remarkable that in that closed space, that only 700 people tested positive. And, um, and then half of those had symptoms. So um, it's an interesting virus and it's interesting times for us as physicians. And we just can't forget the basic principles. But like I say, it's an opportunity to um, be creative and be inventive with what we do with our medical practice. And patients are hungry for help. They're hungry for ways they can help themselves. And this is, I think, going to be very important moving forward. The more patients can help themselves, the more you can help patients help themselves, the less the government will be telling you what to do. So I thank you for listening. And I guess Rebecca will come back to life. I don't, I'll have to ask Rebecca, I'll say. I, well, here I she comes. Here. Oh, goody. Hello. Uh, thank you so very much for joining us. Uh, we had a number of great questions. We had people on Facebook. Uh, I am so excited to have you have joined us today. Thank you everyone else for joining us as well. Um, we were, it was wonderful to have so many people on both Facebook and on, um, on our Zoom call here as well. Um, I had students texting me, um, texting me questions. We had them both on Facebook and here on Zoom. Um, we will be offering this, um, this recording. It will be automatically stre streamed on our Facebook page. Um, and then we will be putting it up on our website and our YouTube channel. Um, in just a few days. So um, Dr. Singleton shared her, her contact information. I put it up on the Facebook page. Um, if you do have any questions for her directly, um, please go ahead and get in contact with her. Uh, if you'd like to get in contact with me, it's Rebecca at BenjaminRushInstitute.org. Um, I will put up my contact information right after this. In the meantime, thank you very much. Thank you for supporting um, this movement and all the wonderful work that we do. Um, as a major movement, and uh, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it. Thank you, everybody. This was great, great fun, and in, in a in a bad situation, but it's always good to talk to folks on just how we as doctors can really move ahead, even in the worst of times. Thank you so much, everyone.